How long does the Christmas glow last in your household? A day, two days, a week? Right? It, 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 takes a, it does eventually fade as we enter what I think of as the what day of the week is it period of time. Like, what, what day of the week is it? It's Sunday, but yesterday really did feel like Tuesday. And uh, I'm not quite sure what tomorrow is. It, it's, it's an odd period of time between now and New Year's. If uh, we measure the Christmas season by the glow of family together and presents under the tree, if that's the demarker uh, of, the fa of the Christmas season, then the Christmas season is over. The glow is faded and it's time to move on. But that is not how the church tells the time when it comes to the Christmas season. The Christmas season is the time when we are focused on the birth of Jesus and what the impact that makes. And there's a little bit more of it. We have this Sunday and, and then Jan up through January 6th, Epiphany. And if you want to count between December 25th to January 6th, yes, that would be the 12 days of Christmas. And so as we continue this Christmas season, we check in with the Holy Family of Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And we find Joseph contemplating a challenging and unexpected question. How, how far will he have to go to protect his son? How far will he have to go? Like practically, like how far away? This is, this is not like esoteric. I, this is a question I hope that you have not had to ask yourself. How far will you have to go to protect your own children? But it is uh, the question he has. And, and we don't know exactly what he is saying about it or thinking about it. For while we have Mary's words and thoughts and actions recorded, we don't have any words of Joseph. None. They've all uh, been lost to, to history. And so um, what we know, the result of his deliberations is he is willing to go, oh, well, he's willing to walk seven hours a day for a month to get to Egypt. That's how long it takes. And traveling with a one-year-old, does anything ever go as you expect? Traveling with small children, and this is long before the days of car seats where you can just click them in and just lift them and go. I mean, this is traveling with a one-year-old is always it's been a challenge, but that, that's what he, he, how far he is willing to go. Uh, he has to contemplate this because he finds out that King Herod, Herod the Great, wants his child to be dead. And Herod has said, if, if there's going to be a king born in, in Israel, it's going to be my children. No, no one else gets to have a child be born to be king. And so Joseph has to run far enough away so that Herod can't get to him. And Egypt is about right. Now, I, uh, just thinking about this, I have a hard time getting my mind around the fear that would be engendered in this, because I've never had, like this would be the equivalent of finding out you have a warrant out for your arrest. And, and I don't know what that feels like. I've never had a warrant out for my arrest. And, and, but just, just that idea of being that scared and, and feeling like you have to run. Now we, we have a word for people who are so afraid that they have to leave their nation and run to another nation. What, what's the word for that? What is someone who has to leave their nation out of fear? It's a refugee, right? The Holy Family is a family at this moment of refugees. That's not the word we usually think of when we're thinking of Christmas. Like the Christmas glow, you say the word refugee, the glow is gone, right? Uh, so what is causing such fear for Joseph? I mean, back to Herod. Herod's scary, right? Herod is making the argument. The way Herod is maintaining his rule over Israel is by saying, you think I'm bad. You mess with me, the Romans will come in and kill you. Right? If you mess with me, the Romans will send their legions in and you will die. Because you, if, you if you revolt, they will, just call, they will come in and they will slaughter you. Actually, what they would do is decimate. Does anyone know, here know, know the history of the word decimate? Right? It comes from Dessa, is 10, right? And so when a Roman legion decimated, they would line everyone up and they would count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and they would kill the 10th person. And then they would just, they would count and they would go through and they would kill a 10th of the population. And so, like you could say, the Roman legion would come in and decimate you. And that's a very practical number. You could look around the room and say, well, 1 in 10 of us would die if the Roman legion showed up. I'm scared, right? And so that's how Herod ruled. With, by the fear of the Roman legion. 
And, and so, uh, and then his children, like father, like son, Archelaus, when Archelaus comes to power, uh, he kills 3,000 people in his first month, people who don't think he should be king. He just starts slaughtering people in, in Jerusalem. And uh, the other Herod, Herod Antipas, the other son, he manages not to kill thousands of people, he may, he, but he ends up being the one who's over Jesus' trial. So what the father tries to do, the son actually succeeds in doing, I guess you'd say. But they're scary people. And so they run. They run to get away from Herod and, and the, that family, and they go to Egypt. Now, Egypt is the least bad option. Like, it, he, Egypt is the least bad option in that if you go back to when Judah fell back in 597 BC, uh, a bunch of Jews of, of Israel at that time fled to Egypt, and so there's a Jewish population there. Then again, in the third century, another cohort of, of sort of, of Jews left to go to Egypt. Uh, there are enough Jews there that they actually made their own translation of what we call the Old Testament, they would call the Bible. And so the concern was, was that they were losing their ability to speak Hebrew generation after generation because the language that was being spoken in Egypt was not Egyptian anymore, it was Greek, right? The Greeks had take, were kind of in charge there. And, and so they, they translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek in 250 BC, give or take. And, and so there's a large Jewish population, that's where you're gonna go if you have to run, but let's not say, let, let's not think it was easy. It's not like Joseph packs up the family and takes a, a, a jaunt. First, it's not a cash society. And so it's not like, when you move, when I moved down here, there was one moment where I cashed out of the bank up in Milan, and I had one piece of paper that had a number on it. Is Here it is, Andy's life savings. I'm going to carry this piece of paper down here. I'm going to hand it to the closest bank I could find as soon as I moved in. I walked down the street and I handed them this piece of paper very carefully. I said, here, deposit it. Just make an account, right? Y'all ever done that where you're carrying that much money all at once? Right? Could, they, could Joseph do that? Nope. Banks haven't been invented yet. Right? They, banks just, they don't exist. And so there's no way for him to transport all of his valuables. And, and he's a carpenter. What are the most important things to a carpenter? Tools. If you're traveling with an infant and you're going to be traveling a for a month, how many tools can you take? A hammer? Like, that, that's about it, right? And so he's, he's going to a place where he, ha he can't bring his value, all, all of his sort of set up, everything he has built up over time. He can't bring the tools of his trade. And yeah, there are Jews who are waiting there and who will welcome him. But you remember back in 250 BC, they wrote a new translation of the Bible because everyone was speaking Greek. And, and what, what is, what's the Holy Family? What do they speak? They speak Hebrew and Aramaic, right? And so they show up, and there's a whole bunch of Jews there who are ready to accept them, and they greet them in Greek, and Joseph doesn't speak Greek. Why would he? Right? And it's, so he shows up, and, so, and he's got to be there for as long as it takes. And it's going to be a while. And it was a while. He had to be there until Herod died. So the question of how far will you go to protect your child... That was a pretty uh, concrete and practical answer he gave. He would go to that distance. He would go to a land that he didn't speak the language and he couldn't bring his tools to protect his son. Now, it is worth acknowledging there are parallels here in the way that uh, the, the most important person in the Old Testament is Moses. Moses is the one who leads the people out of Egypt, establishes the new covenant by going, uh, giving them the law, and then they go 40 years through the wilderness and get to the promised land. And if you look at this, Jesus goes to Egypt and then comes out uh, of Egypt and, and he is baptized and he has 40 days in the wilderness and, then, and also gives the law, which we don't call it the, the Ten Commandments, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, right? So there's, still, there's some parallels there in the way that it, it, as a, Jews, a Jewish person looking at the history of your nation, you look at, look at Jesus and you can see the way that he sort of lives again the history of the nation of Israel. And, and so there's some parallels here that are fascinating. It doesn't downplay the fact that that had to be a hard run for parents. And so after they leave, what happens to the town they've left, right? 
children die. How many children die? Well, if you look at Bethlehem, it's about a thousand people. And if you look at birth, uh, birth rates and you look at uh, how old the children would have been, it's probably like 40 to, or it's about 20 to 30 boys were killed uh, by the, the soldiers of the state. And, and this is a hard thing. There, there's no way to sugarcoat this. It's been tried. Uh, a fellow by the name of Peter Bruegel paints a picture of this, which you'll find up on your screen. And, and this is not the first version of the picture. Because if you look at that picture, it looks like a group of soldiers are coming into town. And you think, well, they're just coming into town. Do you see any blood? Do you see any, like, violence happening? No, because the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolph II looked at this painting and said, we, you can't do that. You have to go back with your paintbrush. And everywhere there's a child who's, who's dying, you paint a pig on top of it, right? We will not talk about this. It's too horrifying. Right, it, it, and it, that's um, and so that's what happens. That, that's not the original. That that's been painted over. Um, and so we 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 can't sugarcoat the fact as much as we'd like to that the first sign of the extreme response which Jesus will draw uh, happens here at his birth, as here Herod the Great is threatened. He has a, a power that is built upon the threat of violence, and Jesus shows up and is going to be the Prince of Peace, and, and that is a threat to power. This is a threat to the government. That's a threat to Herod. And, and so that, that is why there is such this dramatic response. The, the death of these children is a sign of how broken the world can be and how much Jesus' kingdom of peace is needed. Right? So eventually Herod dies, Joseph is able to take his family back, and then as they come back, they settle in Nazareth to get away from Archelaus, the crazy son of Herod, to be under the, in the area that's under Herod Antipas, the not quite as crazy son of Herod. And in this moment, we have the answer to this question, how far will a father go for the sake of his son, his newborn child? And... You can actually answer this question in one of two ways. One is the obvious one. We have one father, Joseph, grappling with the completely unexpected. No one has a child and thinks I'm about to have to handle being a wanted fugitive, right? And, the, and it's the same thing we know parents do today. No one has a child and expects that child to have an illness or a sickness or need surgery right away or any of this. You, you have a child and you expect and you hope everything will be fine, but when it's not, what do you do? You do what you need to, because it's your, it's your boy. You just take care of it, right? So we have the answer to the question one way of answering it. How, how, far, how far will a father go to take care of his son? That far. He'll go to Egypt and as long as it takes. There is another way to answer this question, though, that is worth looking at as well. For Jesus has a complicated family, doesn't he? It's not just his, his uh, Joseph and Mary, but Jesus is also Son of God. And so, how far will the Heavenly Father go to deal with what faces his children? Because for the heaven, our Heavenly Father, none of this is unexpected, right? For Joseph, it was all unexpected. For our Heavenly Father, it was all expected. They knew what was going to happen. Our Heavenly Father knew what was going to happen when Jesus went to earth, when Jesus was born. Jesus, God, our Heavenly Father, knows that in the end, His Son will be safe. But He also knows that the trip to Egypt is just the first of what will be a rather challenging journey home that will end in the cross and only then get to the resurrection. And yet our Father does what a Father does, right? Looks out the, for, not ju just for the good of one child, but for the good of the entire family. That's, that's what Hebrews lays out for us, the, the book of Hebrews. It talks about how when Jesus came to be amongst us, it's because we are brothers and sisters. Right? That's what the, our Heavenly Father does, sends Jesus, not just for the good of his Son, but the, for the good of all of us, looking out for us. And so we still continue to celebrate Christmas today. We celebrate Christmas that Jesus comes to be with us. For that means that Jesus is, to be, is along with us whenever we are refugees, whenever we are ca captured by fear, when we are grappling with what's in front of us, whether it is expected or unexpected. We celebrate that Jesus comes to be with us, for we belong in the kingdom of God that is to come. And to follow Jesus is to be people that are on a journey and following Jesus wherever he 
he may lead us, whether it be Egypt or any other weird place, he, until he leads us home in the kingdom of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand with me and let us confess our faith. 